Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you for joining us today for this Path Life Forum, which is part of a series called Understanding COVID-2019. Today's conversation is called Continuing Essential Service Delivery in a Pandemic, HIV, TB, and Malaria Solutions in Action. My name is Ben Aliwa. I'm the Acting Chief Operating Officer and the Kenya Country Director at PATH and I'll be moderating today's conversation. Before we get started, um, I want to run through a few logistics. We want to hear from you during this conversation. So please share your questions, your comments with us by submitting them to the chat or the Q&A box at any time throughout the presentation. I will be monitoring your questions and we'll be saving time at the end of this hour for questions. Um, I also invite you to join our conversation online by using the hashtag PathLifeForum and tagging us at PathTweets. This call is being recorded and will be distributed for those unable to attend. I also see that we have participants joining us from all over the world, philanthropists, government representatives, corporate partners, and peers. I want to thank you all for doing um, what you're doing for our communities right now, both uh, from where I'm sitting here in East Africa and globally. The format for today's discussion will fully uh, be questions and answers. So we plan to have our videos up as opposed to slides for most of the webinars. However, if internet connectivity becomes a problem, we'll adopt. So, um, for those, um, and I want to, to therefore take this opportunity, for those of you who are less familiar with PATH, um, we are a global team of dedicated um, uh, to achieve health equity so all people and communities can thrive. Together, we are driving public health solutions that meet the most pressing needs of families, communities, and countries. Our specialities range across vaccine research and development, diagnostics, drugs, devices, and health systems. We are a global organization um, and a global team of colleagues working in 70 countries around the world. So just some opening remarks. Um, today's discussion will explore a critical and timely topic. As you'll hear more about later, the WHO, Imperial College, and others recently released a modeling study of how COVID-19 could affect HIV, TB, and malaria problems in the highest burden countries. The projections are eye-opening. So today we'll explore ways with which HIV, TB, and malaria service delivery platforms are being leveraged to support the COVID-19 response while mitigating its impact on delivery of essential health services and protecting frontline healthcare workers and healthcare providers and the clients they serve. We have an excellent panel of speakers with us um, whom I'm excited to introduce. So I'd like to take this um, to start by introducing our first two speakers who will set the stage for our discussion about why continuity of essential services delivery is crucial in a pandemic. We are fortunate to have Lyndon Morrison, the head of Global Fund High Impact Africa Department joining us, as well as Chris Collins, the president of the Global Fight Against AIDS, TB and Malaria. Lyndon Morrison leads the High Impact Africa II Department at the Global Fund. His department sits with the Grant Managing Division, one of the three high impact departments that make up 70% of the Global Fund's grant dispersed to countries, and 65% of those um, of the burden of those three diseases. He's responsible for ensuring that the Global Fund investment delivers sustainable impact against AIDS, TB, and malaria in eight high burden countries, Ethiopia, Kenya, Mozambique, South Africa, uh, Tanzania and Zanzibar, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. The work 
he does includes leading multidisciplinary country teams in making quality risk tailor decisions on grants and building strategic partnerships with government, civil society, technical and financing partners. Chris, on the other hand, has served as the president of Friends of the Global Fund Against AIDS, TB and Malaria since 2016. He leads the organization's efforts to engage US decision makers in the life-saving work of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB and Malaria and the importance of expanding global investment to bring these epidemics to an end. In 2019, he played a central role in multi-task holder advocacy to achieve the first increase in US support to the Global Fund in six years, the third largest increase in the history of US support. And with that, I'm gonna to transition to our two panelists. I'll start with you, Chris. I'd like to start with a question for you. As I mentioned in the beginning of recent modeling study released by WHO, Imperial College London and others, estimates that COVID-2019 epidemic could cause a 10%, 20% and 36% increase in HIV, TB and malaria related deaths respectively. Over the next five years, the report notes that the greatest impact of HIV would be from treatment interruptions for TB from reductions in timely diagnosis and treatment of new cases and for malaria reduce prevention activities such as planned insecticide-treated net campaigns. Can you tell us more about the impacts we are seeing globally? Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Ben, and thanks very much for including me in this webinar. Um, I really appreciate that you're doing it. Um, Lyndon and I just, as you've said, want to provide some background for the beginning of the webinar, and I'll talk a little bit about what some of the predictions are about potential impacts. Um, and Lyndon will talk about what we're seeing on the ground thus far, and then I'll come back and talk a lot, little bit about the funding opportunities and uh, needs, particularly with the U.S. focus. So picking um, off from where you said, there really have been dire warnings about uh, how COVID-19 could lead to service disruptions in the AIDS, TB, and malaria responses. How do you deliver bed nets or HIV prevention in the context of social distancing? How do you ensure people living with TB or who may have TB come in for testing and treatment during a lockdown? So these are some of the, the challenges that people in the field are grappling with right now. You noted the Imperial College uh, estimates, and they're extremely concerning. Um, what they did was look at what would happen if there was uh, sustained service disruptions, for example, delivery of ART or TB services or malaria prevention. Um, and as you said, they saw uh, uh, mortality from AIDS, TB, and malaria increase by 10%, 20%, and 36% respectively over a five year period. That is only if we don't succeed in what we need to do. That's uh, what could happen uh, if we don't find ways to deliver those services and make people feel comfortable accessing health services. Um, it's important to note that Imperial College is not alone in um, uh, identifying major impacts on AIDS, TB and malaria responses if we don't find ways to get services out. So for example, UNAIDS has estimated that a six month disruption of ART service delivery due to COVID could lead to more than half a million additional deaths related to HIV, including with tu tuberculosis in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we're already hearing things from the field that suggest some of those outcomes are possible. For example, uh, the Gauteng province in South Africa, uh, the health department has said that from the uh, end of March to last week, about 10,950 patients failed to collect their antiretroviral medicines. That's about a 20% reduction already in people accessing ART, very concerning. 
In the area of TB, of course, people living with TB uh, can be more vulnerable to COVID, but also just in terms of uh, TB services, Stop TB Partnership has estimated that with a three month lockdown in services and a 10 month restoration period where those are gradually coming back, that could lead to an additional 6.3 million TB cases and 1.4 million additional deaths over five years. And again, we're already seeing things in the field that suggest these kinds of estimates are possible. India announced their lockdown uh, on March 24th, resulting from COVID. And the public health system has been directed primarily towards addressing COVID-19, of course. The Central Tuberculosis, Tuberculosis Division in India, their dashboard shows that TB diagnoses have fallen by nearly 70% over the first month of that lockdown. So that's a huge concern, of course, in terms of people accessing the TB services they need, but also the potential for increased transmission of TB during this time when people aren't getting diagnosed. For malaria, the WHO estimates that disruptions in bed net campaigns and the distribution of anti-malarial medicines could mean that malaria deaths in Sub-Saharan Africa could double because of COVID. So these are the kinds of possible outcomes that we all need to work together to find ways of avoiding. But let me at this point hand it over to Lyndon to discuss the some of the realities that they're seeing on the ground. Thank you, Hans. Over to you, Lyndon. Ben, I, I thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone, for inviting me to this um, webinar, a very important webinar. Um, you heard from um, Chris well, how it's the dire predictions, and I want to start my um, to share with you what our executive director Peter Sands said. He mentioned that the fight against the three diseases and strengthened health system and COVID is one and the same fight. So I repeat, is one and the same fight. If we do not see it as one and the same fight, we cannot adequately address the, the issues that I was um, raised by Chris. In that regard, what the Global Fund did, first of all, we engaged um, and we responded rapidly. I'll discuss with you as we go along about the, the, um, the funding, the new funding source, but we engaged rapidly because as we, we saw the challenges, we heard about the challenges from on the ground, and you also heard what was just mentioned by Chris. Um, the challenges were real. Um, and we reached out to, for example, the Global Fund, we reached out to some, many of our partners on the ground, including the implementers, and to discuss some of these challenges. Chris mentioned some of the challenges caused by, directly caused, attributed to the lockdown, which included, um, first of all, disruption of services, um, gender-based violence, and of course, um, one of the big ones is a diversion of resources. Um, while, we, while we see, while we saw all of these challenges, um, we also recognize the fact that the global fund must act. So our, our action were basically at different levels, at a, at a corporate level and the global level. We and we and the global fund played a critical role in working with partners to first of all ensure access to um, to diagnosis and treatment uh, related to COVID um, and all the other other equipment. We also at, at a global fund level, we've immediately engaged and um, aggressively engaged in um, using the virtual platforms. And the virtual platforms, for example, uh, like, like the one we're on, we found it very, very helpful. Actually, I must say that um, I have not seen, there may be some, some, some uh, discussion of this. I think we're doing more work now, actually. Within the context of the virtual platform, we also, we also try to engage with, with, our, with our implementers, get very, very close to our implementers. Um, to put into some context, what Chris mentioned is very, is very, very real. For example, you are aware that the Global Fund, we raised um, so, uh, monies, and this is a year that we actually transitioning, supposed to be stepping up to the fight to, to, um, towards um, seeing a reversal of the three diseases. However, um, within that context, we did, the, the question for us was not what to be done, but how we had to, how to address COVID while we continue to the fight against the three diseases. Uh, we have seen um, from on the ground, uh, we have seen, for example, potential disruption of several bed net campaign. Chris mentioned to you around the, um, the discussion around the, T the TB issues. Uh, we have seen also um, potential disruption of um, 
of services and also potential because of disruption of um, some pre prevention activities potentially increases in um, anti, um, in, in, um, in new cases and in new infections of ARVs. However, mm -hmm. on the other side, Ben, what we saw also, it was, a, it was a, a, that sense of ownership, that sense of drive to address some of these issues. For example, it was, it was it's amazing to see the um, civil society organization take on board um, the, and, and really hi highlight to us how they were how they utilizing the Global Fund platform here is a global platform to, to address issues of fear, fear and stigma. One of the challenges we saw, for example, with malaria and TB diagnosis, one of the challenges we observe is that the messaging at the community level was not clear. So what had, folks were not, um, um, they did not feel comfortable um, at going to health facility, they did not feel comfortable seeking treatment. As an example, that we had, we, had, we experienced upsurges in malaria in a particular country. And in that country, um, that upsurgence, one of the key drivers was the lack of PPE equipment, was the, was the fear, et cetera, et cetera. So what the Global Fund has done in, for example, is to make sure that we, we, our, we, our system, the flexibility in our system could, could um, provide resources to address these fears. Additionally, um, we've worked very, very closely with our partners to really implement, uh, to, to put in place flexibilities within our guidelines so that um, to, to address, to for example, treatment, et cetera, how can we support multi-month scripting, uh, multi-month dispensing of drugs, et cetera. More importantly, we really worked very, very closely with the, with the civil society organizations to really address issues of um, how can we, uh, to, to get an intelligence from the ground, but more importantly, to support the, um, the governments to really plan these exercises, to plan how to work with the communities and to, um, to address the, the stigma, et cetera. I will stop there for now to take any other questions. Thank you, Linda. Ben, um, shall I talk a little bit about the funding context? Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Lyndon. Just to, to follow up on that, and, and uh, there have been many, you know, good signs already in, in the ways that uh, people are using existing platforms and responding. It's also worth noting that in several African countries, uh, they really acted decisively to um, limit the spread of COVID thus far, as far as we can tell. There's been a, a lot of examples of uh, good policy making in Africa that I think could help um, with the response to COVID. Thinking about what the potential strategies are to mitigate the impacts of COVID on HTB and malaria, there's, there's several areas and Lyndon named a couple that you know, we could be doing more around dispensing several months of ARVs to patients so that they don't have to come to the clinic at off, as often, modifying HIV prevention programs that are normally based in schools or community centers so that people can be reached directly if they don't go to those places, conducting direct outreach to people uh, with TB who might not wanna seek testing or treatment in a facility, um, and very crucially, hiring additional community health workers and providing them uh, with uh, personal protection equipment so that they can conduct bed net distribution on a house-to-house -house basis instead of having people having to come to a central distribution area. Um, and you know, platforms like the Global Fund and other existing uh, global health platforms also are in a position to do those things, but in addition, do some other things to help communities address COVID um, in other ways and shore up their health systems. So getting PPE out for health workers, providing diagnostics, and being ready one day to provide treatments to people to address COVID. Those are all possible uses of Global Fund and other platforms that are out there. As Lyndon noted, the Global Fund has acted quickly to uh, make funds available to countries it works with, creating the COVID-19 response mechanism uh, through various flexibilities and transfer of funding they've, they've made. Uh, up to a billion dollars available for countries to um, do various things responding co to COVID, but also shore up their health systems and mitigate challenges to the HTB and malaria uh, responses. So far, funding's been approved for 83 countries, and there's been six regional grants. That's a total of $138 million uh, through grant flexibilities. The need, however, is going to be much greater. Um, uh, in terms of what's needed to 
through the Global Fund platform to mitigate damage against the HTB and malaria epidemics, but also to help communities with COVID. Um, so when the board of the Global Fund created the COVID-19 response mechanism, you know, they, they provided some flexibilities, put in some money that was available there, but also made that mechanism available so that public and private donors could make contributions to the fund. And the advocacy community in the United States is now requesting that the U.S. contribute $1 billion towards that Global Fund COVID-19 response mechanism. Um, we think we know that billions of dollars are going to be required um, in, in that mechanism and that we think a fair U.S. share at this point is a billion dollars. And in the context of the kinds of massive spending bills that Congress is rightly passing now around COVID, you know, dedicating uh, billions of dollars to global health and a billion dollars to the Global Fund in this case um, is really just a very tiny percentage. In fact, it's important to know that of the trillions of dollars the United States has committed to the COVID response already, just 0.1% of that is going to global. Uh, uh, global efforts to address the epidemic. And that's in the context of usually, you know, year in and year out, the United States dedicates about 1% uh, of our federal budget to international assistance. In this case with COVID, which is by definition a global problem, we've only dedicated one-tenth of that rate uh, to the global problem. So we're really urging that in the next supplemental funding for COVID, uh, there is money for the global response in general, global health, but also uh, for the Global Fund, Gavi, um, and other places. I also just would say in closing for this section, um, all of these questions about how Congress and the administration respond at this point to COVID um, sets the stage for what the world looks like after COVID and where we're going in terms of global health financing. Hopefully donor governments, including our own, are really going to recognize much more clearly how we're all connected um, across the world and that health security across the world should be a top priority for donors. And we need to think about what health security means, not just for people in the United States, but also what health security means for people in other countries. We don't wanna think about health security too narrowly now when we have this moment of clarity of how we're all connected. So that could mean a recommitment to end epidemics that kill millions of people year in and year out, like AIDS, TB, and malaria. Uh, it could be investing in more local decision-making about how communities want to work to uh, themselves be prepared to identify and respond to epidemics. Uh, so there's an urgent need right now for Congress to pass additional funding, but I think some of these bigger questions too uh, come into play as Congress grapples with global health financing down the road and as the presidential uh, campaign heats up and we have candidates talking about their vision for the U.S. role globally. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Lyndon and Chris for um, a fantastic overview. And I think um, you are absolutely apt in terms of the astronomical numbers um, that we're seeing in terms of potential disruptions to services, to, to um, to supplies, um, you know, and also where the governments are actually already taking early decisions in terms of policy and other containing measures, as you reference in, in Africa. I think that's really great. Um, I, I, and now I'd like to invite a few of my colleagues um, at PATH to join this discussion to share some tangible examples from our HIV, TB, and malaria programs across the globe. Um, we have with us Dr. Kimberly Green, um, who is PATH's Global Director for HIV and TB, who oversees a large portfolio of work spanning um, introduction to novel technologies, to innovations, to HIV prevention, testing, treatment service delivery, as well as programming that addresses vital hepatitis and opioid addiction. Um, she has drawn her um, more than 20 years experience in expertise in private sector engagement to inform how to rapidly pivot HIV and TB service delivery to ensure continuity of services to people living with HIV and AIDS and OTB while supporting COVID-19 responses. 
We also have with us Dr. Shibu Vajayan, who is a medical doctor and TB technical specialist with more than 20 years of experience working across the spectrum of public health systems with a particular expertise in designing and deploying private sector engagement strategies uh, to improve urban health systems. He currently serves as PATH's TB Global Technical Director overseeing TB and HIV programs in India and providing technical oversight to PATH's TB programs globally. And lastly, but not least, we have um, Caroline Piri Chibawe, who is a medical doctor who spent many years working with Zambia Ministry of Health, including as Director of Mother and Child Health. She leads PATH's role in the PMI-funded project uh, for advancement of malaria outcomes, working in partnership with the government of Zambia to improve reporting, analysis, decision-making, and delivery of malaria services. Uh, thank you all colleagues for being with us today. Earlier, Linda noted a number of challenges and new barriers that the COVID-19 outbreak and response have fought would pose to ongoing HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria service delivery. Kim, at PATH, we have used an approach to protect, mitigate, and support to guide how we respond to COVID-19 while continuing essential services. Can you give us a very brief overview of this approach and how it has guided your team's work? Great, thanks, Ben. Yeah, so starting in March, uh, we put in place a framework uh, to guide our response to COVID-19 through uh, our HIV, TB, and malaria services. And so um, it's based on three pillars. The first focuses on protect, the second um, on mitigate, and the third on support. So protect um, is really about uh, training and equipping facility and community-based healthcare workers to deliver essential services um, for those three diseases, uh, while also um, being able to uh, safely triage for those exposed to or having symptoms of COVID-19. So this has involved, um, of course, ensuring access to PPEs, uh, but also revamping uh, facility flow uh, to uh, maximize uh, physical distancing, as well as pre-screening of clients before routine care appointments. Um, and so this has been implemented across a number of countries, including Kenya, DRC, Ukraine, Vietnam, and others. So, but under this pillar as well, uh, you know, we're also really focused on um, how do we ensure um, more immediate or longer term social protection for the individuals that we serve. Um, and this has really included uh, training providers um, around actively assessing and responding to intimate partner violence, which we know is on the rise. Um, also um, around addressing economic insecurities, uh, as well as mental health morbidities, which are at an all time high right now. The second component focuses on mitigate, and we've talked about that. Chris and, and Lyndon have provided some examples, including related to uh, making multi-month dispensing uh, available. But this is focused on how do we ensure continuity of care, um, for the three diseases, how do we rapidly um, pivot how services are offered to ensure that that happens? Um, and how do we do so with confidentiality um, while also factoring in uh, gender inequities? The third uh, pillar is really around how can we build off of the platforms that have been established around HIV, TB, and malaria uh, towards the COVID-19 response, but without jeopardizing core services. So there's a number of ways in which we're um, you know, engaged in the, the larger COVID-19 response through these three diseases. So that includes um, you know, uh, using existing lab infrastructure uh, towards diagnosis and monitoring of SARS-CoV-2, also adapting some of the excellent uh, TB infectious prevention and, and control protocols for um, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, as well, you know, contact tracing is a critical element of the response, and uh, there's a lot of learning from TB and, and HIV that we've been able to draw upon. Uh, and then lastly, really focusing on advising governments and how to engage with communities uh, and the private sector in the response. Thanks. Thank you, Kim. Um, thank you. Shibu, uh, let me turn on to you. Uh, uh, another recent modeling study by the Stop TB Partnership and Imperial College London emphasized that 
COVID-19 may strip back five years of progress, making elimination of tuberculosis by 2035 almost impossible. What actions can countries take both during and following the COVID outbreak to mitigate um, the impact of response efforts on TB services and burden? Well, thank you, Ashley, um, uh, Ben, for, and also thank Chris, uh, uh, Lyndon, and, and, uh, and Kim, Kim for actually setting that stage and also pretty much actually you stated the problem well. Uh, on coming on to the solutions and actions, and we have seen that sequentially uh, from the WHO side and SOFTB side, there has been advisories actually going out, uh, starting from January onwards, how essentially capturing the spirit of destigmatizing, protecting the TB patients, and, and some sort of leveraging uh, existing uh, uh, TB support system and preserving the, the essential services. And almost all the countries actually followed, uh, I mean, taken that, uh, I mean, uh, the principle of that, and then given advisories to the uh, respective program managers of provinces and, and for the county level. Uh, on the specifics of actually what we can do, I also see, uh, I mean, I, I have also heard that Kim mentioned about the infection prevention control measures uh, and also leveraging the lab network. Besides that, uh, this is an opportunity for us to actually leverage on uh, some critical issues, which also been mentioned by uh, uh, mentioned by WHO. So this is an opportunity to push for a shorter regimen for uh, uh, for MDRTB, and also hop onto the communities. Actually, this is where that we have to actually look at community support systems. Uh, how we can leverage so that the TB patients who are already diagnosed can. Uh, are not in not coming to the health system and getting infected. We are, in a way, we are protecting and also empowering community. And also the other other piece actually there is a lot of innovations as, uh, which recently happened. And and to be to be very specific, Global Fund uh, Empowered Committee has actually given uh, uh, specific sanctions to M2000 and BD Max. These are actually specific TB diagnostic systems which have a multiple capability to actually detect both COVID as well as the uh, tuberculosis. So these are opportunities to source in supplementary funding. Thanks for the support from the, the flexibility, which has already been built in, uh, uh, in the global fund system and also the additional funding. So these are the opportunities for countries to actually kind of leverage that and then put in this system and push for that. And also some, uh, also going back to how we can, so if I structure it into some of these things are leveraging existing support, some of these things are actually catch up to actually kind of go for uh, finding the extra cases. Some of this thing actually as innovation. So, so if I do the catch up, what are the tools available? We have actually X-ray and Gene Expert has been there for a while in the TB control program, which has been, which has not been fully tapped. So these are op these are opportunities to actually use the contact tracing using the right algorithm, use a catch up actually for intensified case finding using uh, X-ray uh, with AI capabilities to read the X-ray systems, and and do the catch up. And also the rollout of uh, adherence technologies. So there is a there is a uh, whole plethora of digital adherence technologies available. This will augment our community systems. So when the community actually offer patient support system through uh, human touch, uh, that will actually the, the the digital adherence platforms will augment their existing uh, I mean their support. And then at la at scale at large. Uh, that also enable uh, to, uh, I mean, uh, to get plugged into the existing telemedicine platform, which has been, uh, which actually wraps into a whole lot of actually comprehensive digital enable tech care systems. So I think these are things uh, broadly, uh, I see as an opportunity and solutions and bits and pieces actually this we are, as path we are actually implementing in, uh, in many countries. For example, in the uh, infection prevention control is we largely been uh, 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 framed and been trained and disseminated in uh, Zambia. Uh, the digital adherence system has been uh, leveraged in uh, in Ukraine, and the private sector engagement has been leveraged in India. I'll talk about that in, when subsequent questions come in. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shibu. Thanks for sharing that country perspective, but also the opportunities that exist in you know innovation in digital and diagnostics and and leveraging um, some of what's already working today. I think that's really um, good to hear and encouraging. Um, I wanna to turn to Caroline. Uh, Caroline, you've supported the WHO in developing guidance for delivering malaria interventions during this time. 
Can you speak to the process of developing the global guidance and how you adapt it to the national level? Um, thank you so much, uh, Ben, and uh, thank you for the previous speakers. Yes, um, and I think maybe just to start that um, national programs, I think we're looking towards WHO to basically be given guidance on uh, how they can be able to continue with the malaria program and didn't want to see a reversal in the progress made in the fight against malaria. So it was uh, an opportune time. Um, a document was developed called Tailoring uh, Malaria Interventions in the COVID-19 Response. And I think the reason why it was actually, um, the, why the, 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 the document was developed and as part, we supported uh, the WHO and partners to develop these guidelines, was really to see how governments can continue implementing vector control, can continue uh, with the supply chain uh, management, con uh, to also continue with case management as well as SBC. Um, so as, uh, as PATH, we took part in this uh, development guidelines uh, and we developed these global guidelines. Uh, we, what we did is we actually analyzed data um, and modeling different scenarios to predict how we thought the COVID-19 pandemic would be able to impact malaria transmission, especially in the high burden countries. And this is what helped inform uh, decision making. Uh, we also uh, based this also on country experiences um, in the different uh, intervention areas, country experiences in vector control. Uh, a number of countries are actually going to start uh, distributing um, ITNs through mass distribution. So how was that going to continue, especially when with COVID-19 we're advocating uh, for social distancing and really staying at home messages. We also, based on data, we're advocating for continued, um, albeit modified delivery of essential malaria services. We do not want to see an interruption in services and we wanted to ensure that uh, uh, this doesn't threaten uh, the progress made in reducing malaria. Um, in terms of the supply chain, I think there was also a team that was looking at um, the supply chain and uh, we are all cognizant that because of the delays in, in, um, in airline travel and, and uh, shipping, we are seeing um, commodities, countries being affected with commodities, especially rapid diagnostic tests and, and, um, and ACTs. So that was, is also included on the guidance being given to the countries by WHO. Uh, we are also seeing um, SBC, um, some of the guidance is that for SBC implementation, such as community engagement, person-to-person -person, um, interventions should be put on hold, but we focus more on um, community engagement, which is more mass media and facility-based, just to protect the community going out. There was also a component uh, which we looked at called uh, on case management, how to continue testing and treating, testing, because the importance about malaria is early testing. Early testing and it's being done by both health facility and community health workers. So this has to continue and um, uh, community health worker, but this has to be done with provision of protective clothing and infection prevention uh, at all times. So um, it was a good opportunity. The document was developed by WHO and was shared to the countries and the countries have been able to adapt uh, the findings from this same document, which gives them guidance. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Caroline. That's really useful. Um, and just to see how Zambia is basically adapting uh, those guidelines at, at various levels. Um, I want to quickly go back to Kim. Um, Kim, pre-COVID-19, there was increasing focus on differentiating, decentralizing HIV service delivery to offer greater choice and more person-centered options, such as community delivery, HIV testing, treatment, and PrEP. How has COVID impacted these efforts? Yeah, I, I think the impact has been mixed. Um, we've, uh, on the one hand, we have definitely seen a very rapid um, response of uh, creative ways of ensuring continuity of care, um, and it's been really fantastic to see. So one of the key shifts that we've seen, um, and we're all experiencing this now, is really going virtual. So uh, where a lot of uh, support for ART or PrEP, for example, is happening by phone, by WhatsApp, um, by Zoom. 
Uh, and um, we've also seen now shifts in policies in countries to enable that. So for example, in Ukraine, uh, doctors are now able to prescribe and start individuals on treatment in the penal sector through Skype initiation, for example. Uh, similarly, in Vietnam, people are starting on um, PrEP, um, all through an online consultation. So that was that started very quickly uh, through March and April to respond to clinics being shuttered and not being able uh, to um, see individuals, but also the fear uh, that individuals um, experienced in coming into health services. Uh, there's also been a boost in coverage of some of the, the pre-COVID differentiated care models uh, like community ART groups. So we're seeing this in, in DRC, for example. Um, and then some creative responses with combining services. So for in Kenya with adolescent girls and young women, combining a number of health services in one go just to minimize contact uh, with uh, the health service. So you know, offering HIV testing, family planning, well baby uh, services and prep all together. Uh, I wanna say um, really huge kudos uh, to the Global Fund, uh, really hearing from Lyndon in terms of just the flexibility that's been offered. Um, for these creative responses, but also to USAID, CDC, PEPFAR, uh, UNITAID, Gates Foundation, just to name a few, who have very, very quickly responded um, to enable uh, implementers to, to find uh, different ways of offering services to ensure that continuity. Uh, and also, uh, as Caroline mentioned, kudos to WHO for the very quick pragmatic guidance as well. Um, but I wanna say, you know, things are complicated, it is a mixed situation. So, you know, not everyone, we have issues with supply chain, right? And so that's actually peeling back our efforts related to multi-month dispensing in some countries. There's issues with access to Wi-Fi and phones, which are also minimizing um, access that people have to essential services. Um, and there's also issues with, you know, homelessness, for example, um, and the complexity of confidentiality when you're being contacted in your home um, around being on PrEP or being on ART, for example. So I just wanna close by saying, building off of something that uh, Chris said, you know, I mean, I think the hope here is, is that where COVID-19 has really enabled faster progress in client-centered models and these differentiated approaches, uh, the hope is, is that these get encoded moving forward um, once the pandemic is under control and become part of normal service delivery. So I'll stop there, thanks. Thanks, Kim. Um, thank you for sharing that perspective. And I think you are absolutely right in terms of like, how complex um, this gets. Shibu, just very briefly, PATH has a history of collaborating with the private sector, including manufacturers, fostering engagement between public and private sector partners to extend reach of health services, particularly for TB in India, through the Global Fund supported JIT project. How is the private sector being leveraged to support COVID diagnostics, surveillance, and contact tracing efforts in India and elsewhere? Yeah, well, uh, so as Chris also laid out in uh, his opening remarks about there is a 70% decline in, uh, in the notifications and uh, from, the, from the NICSHARE dashboard by Government of India. We have seen the same kind of decline in the private sector as well. So we have notif notified almost 76% decline compared to the last quarter. Uh, which is in the private sector notification. Largely because of the lockdown situation is being extended, there are people who are not able to travel, clinics are still closed. I mean, having said that, actually, uh, the government of India is uh, open to collaborate with the private sector, specifically for TB control. There are policies actually enables uh, to procure services from the private sector. So on once, one hand, actually, we have that, uh, uh, and we have a constraint right now because they are not available uh, in full, full scheme. Uh, so wherever it is available, uh, so PATH as an organization, because of our legacy of working with uh, this Global Fund G project, almost uh, for uh, 50,000 plus doctors and clinics uh, which we are in, engaged. What we are now doing is actually building that, maintaining that relationship and also giving that information to the government saying about the bed availability in the private sector, the, the skill set available in the private sector. And now government has actually reached out to the private sector to source that services for the COVID response. And, and on the other side, we also actually provide through the project and also through the private sector, uh, the services of the patients who are actually catered in the private sector by, by, by leveraging drugs from the public to the private, uh, so that, that they are not, the drug uh, supplies are not interrupted. So uh, on, on the same note, we, I would also want to actually kind of state the larger audience uh, 
India is the major supplier of uh, drugs to the globe, uh, uh, generic drugs, uh, specifically ARV and uh, TB drugs. We have a situation here and uh, we also need to take a note of that situation because of we have disruptions in manufacturing uh, uh, because of the lockdown situations. People are not able to move the supplies. People are there. Are, there is a human resource crunch. So in the coming months as a larger community globally, we need to probably put pressure and advocate uh, for uh, I mean, all, the, all the global agencies to put pressure on them to kind of augment and amplify their uh, existing manufacturing capacity to catch up with uh, so that uh, we can avoid disruptions. Uh, on, uh, so largely we are seeing private sector opening up in the diagnostics also because we have a network of huge network of labs. Now that we have the same platform of gene expert coming with this extra solution for COVID. And similarly, there is a true NAT which is coming up with uh, their own solution, beta cow solution. So these two are actually as fast we have leveraged uh, uh, and do a mapping of the lab where this actually, they can do it and then submit it to the government. So the government now opened up these services to uh, these platforms to actually offer dual services, both COVID as well as TV services. Uh, in the coming days, uh, the, there will be more positive responses uh, uh, by leveraging the private sector for both TV as well as uh, COVID, which we will, we will see that. Thank you so much. I'm stopping there. Thank you. Thanks, Shibu. And um, just before we move to the Q&A uh, session with a larger audience, I just want to circle back to Lyndon um, with one question around, you know, a community-centered um, and informed response is key to COVID-19 control efforts are effective, inclusive, and humane. What role is the community playing now that, um, now and what more can be done to ensure strong accountability for the COVID-2019 response? Ben, thanks a lot for that. I think um, the biggest revelation in this entire response to COVID is the important role of the community. At the Global Fund, I think we've observed that the heart of, the, of the, um, getting things done, as I mentioned, the how is being conducted by the community. They are at the center of everything. I think Kimberly mentioned um, the mixed, the mixed um, approaches so far, but are the mixed results. But this is something we think we could really build on, the, the sheer resilience, the innovations, and, 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 and the important role. As an example, what we have noticed in most countries that have responded adequately to, um, to COVID, the community is at the center of the response. The community sits at the, at the national level. The community designs the, um, the, um, the policies, inform the policies, and also design the implementation. The community plays a very, very critical role. And it's, it's interesting to see in some of the countries where the government has taken a step back and allow the community actually to address the issues of, of communication and getting the right messages over. Um, at a global level, this is what, if it's um, the global fund, is really pushing to um, really ensure that the community is sitting at, at, at that table. As folks have pointed out, the, the major issue now is access, access to whether it's to testing, access to PPE, and the, and the message that at the end of the day, that the community has got to deliver the hard messages when they're not there. But the community, so we think there's a, there must be a strong, um, there must be a seat at the global level for the community. You mentioned also about um, accountability. We are, we are strongly um, um, supporting, um, and Chris will be aware of this, this was something recently discussed a lot at our board, about um, really um, strengthening community monitoring. Uh, this is something that we, uh, within our program, it's part of the program, but it's, in, within the context of COVID-19 has become more prevalent, more, more um, important. Why so? Um, while the Global Fund has made a lot of, um, uh, of a, um, use our platform, which includes the community, um, to really address the um, the COVID um, the challenge of COVID nineteen, what we've observed is that we must agree that for all of us it's, it's something new, uh, particularly for us get putting um, putting money out there. Which to understand, we're trying to get this sense of if the folks are actually accessing the services, if the work has been done. So we are really pushing and um, and, and really supporting a community, strong community monitoring and a strong strength of the community system. I close by uh, by um, rem uh, by saying it once again. We, this is the greatest, this is the, um, to us at the fund, the community and community engagement is, is, is a heart, is at the heart of this, um, this response. And um, I, 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 just re I just recall um, um, the, the, your colleague, our colleague who just talked about the bed nets. The big discussion now in bed nets distribution 
is to use the, so use the community workers to do to um, conduct the distribution. So if there's one thing I hope we could take away, and I hope Kimberly could write, could document it, what work in the community, why it worked, so we do not lose this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lyndon. And, and that's actually a great, great segment, uh, segue to the next um, questions. I think that's a punchline. Community is critical in, our, uh, in the success of our response. Um, we have a lot of great questions coming in from our audience, and I want to make sure we save time for them. So I'll just dive in um, to some of them uh, for the panelists. Given the current, uh, the question is, given the current sparse data on incident on PCR confirmed COVID-19 in rural Kenya and other communities in East Africa, what is the panel's perspective on how the situation with respect to resource diversion from HIV, TB, and malaria may change as more hard data on the public health significance of COVID is acquired? So that's one question to, um, to the panel. I'm happy to repeat. Any takers? Can you repeat? Yeah. Um, I'll quickly repeat the question. Given the current sparse data on the incidence of uh, PCR confirmed COVID-19 in rural Kenya and other countries in East Africa, what is the panel's perspective on how the situation with respect to resource diversion from HIV, TB and malaria may change as more hard data on the public health significance of COVID-19 is acquired. Chris, do you want to take that one? Or Lyndon? Um, in I think, <laughs> hey, let me just start. I, well, I, I mean, I think one obvious point here is that we need more resources. There shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't be eating the response to AIDS, TB, and malaria and other health to address this new crisis. You know, for decades, for <laughs> centuries, we've been underinvesting in addressing um, these global epidemics. Um, we, you know, could be on a path to ending AIDS, TB, and malaria with development of new technology and scale up uh, and smart delivery of, of uh, current and future technology. But we're not investing to accomplish that achievable goal. And that was true before COVID. So, I mean, we're talking today about the immediate response to COVID, but also about how we all need to work together to make sure that COVID, the disaster that it is, is also an inflection point for us, that we change business as usual going forward. And part of that means increased resources and investment in health, both by implementing countries themselves, but also by donors to um, scale up the benefits of science to everybody. So for me, the answer to that is um, don't accept a zero sum game here, but rather realize this is an opportunity for us to invest in health in interventions that work and that that's a moral obligation. If I, could just echo, if I could just echo Chris there and, and I, I, where I started when I mentioned our, um, um, our executive director, Peter Sands, highlighting that this is one and the same fight. Fighting COVID, HIV, it's one and the same fight. And I would want to point out also, um, in developing countries, particularly Kenya, as I cover Kenya, um, if you speak to one, someone in Kenya now, so the senior, um, most folks in Kenya, and most folks in, um, in several countries we cover, the success of the COVID response is largely due to the platform from, from um, HIV. Uh, um, as a matter of fact, um, we had a, there's a discussion this morning, actually, for the interesting question. And the big discussion is not, is, is how do we leverage these platforms to really ensure that we could um, to, um, effectively um, address the COVID, um, the COVID response. More importantly, I, I think that is a brilliant question, but I think if it's, if it's and just to pick up on what Chris said, if the question was, um, I would have, if the question was framed was how can we leverage it and also what, in, um, what are the gaps we see, I think one of the challenges, one of the gaps that was raised this morning in the discussion we had only today actually 
was it was not a matter of resources, but it was access to resources. Because they don't have the access to the testing, they cannot inform the, the response adequately. They, the response cannot be timely. So because of access, the lack of access to timely resources, which is testing, et cetera, what you cannot effectively leverage that great platform we have, HIV. It's interesting to note, the big discussion around the globe is contact tracing. Who know contract tracing better than this, this audience? Thank you. <laughs> Great, thanks. Thanks, Chris and Lyndon. Uh, I think that really does um, answer that question fundamentally. Um, Caroline, there's a specific question for you. Can you share some examples of how we are leveraging the current systems and tools we've built to fight malaria and also to support COVID response? Um, thank you, Ben. Um, so one of the things that uh, we have been working on in Zambia is um, support to the government um, in terms of the, the response to, to COVID. And uh, one of the investments has been in our lab. We have been working uh, very closely with uh, National Malaria Elimination Program in their lab. And this has actually paid off. So we are using um, the lab to the genome of malaria parasites to detect resistance to anti-malaria drugs. Uh, we recently began sequencing COVID-19 virus samples to better understand COVID's genetic trail in Zambia and hopefully uh, regionally like Malawi. This has improved understanding of the transmission patterns. So our lab strength is actually one of the areas we're working with. Um, we are also supporting the, the ministry with um, training um, I think somebody talked about community, not um, leaving out the community health workers. So we are, the ministry has given a go ahead for us to continue with ICCM training to ensure that tra uh, management is as close to the family as possible. So leveraging that, uh, we are helping with community case uh, management and surveillance with the community health workers. Um, in Senegal, we are supporting the Ministry of Health in adapting the global guidance into national procedures and these include on safety protocols, treatment of malaria, for handling and transporting uh, COVID test samples, for training health workers. Uh, we are also been adapting an existing data visualization tool in DHIS2 that we can use to track malaria hotspots to monitor and manage uh, COVID. And um, we are also very proud of our global health security groundwork we've laid in Senegal and the DRC. So right now we have conversations which are already happening see, regarding how we can use malaria surveillance systems to monitor potential outbreaks. And we are integrating that into our data visualization uh, dashboards. So um, we are really working with the ministry and uh, supporting through the, we have a, an integrated uh, COVID response platform, which is supporting the National Public Health Institute to ensure that there's, uh, the national emergency operation centers are working and supporting the national malaria uh, control programs in the different countries. Um, thank you, thank you, Caroline. Thank you for that. And I'm just realizing that we are at the top of time. Um, I'm just gonna ask one very last pressing question to Kim. Um, a worrying aspect of COVID really is about stigma and discrimination. And the question is, what lessons can we leverage from the HIV response to ensure that countries are leading their COVID-2019 response efforts with a human rights-based lens? Yeah, um, thanks, Ben. You know, I think uh, starting in January, uh, as many of us were seeing the rise of cases uh, in Wuhan um, and then elsewhere, um, you know, many of us couldn't help but think back to uh, the early days of HIV um, and the stigma, discrimination, and isolation that people who are being diagnosed with uh, COVID-19 or who are affected by the disease um, might have been experiencing. You know, so for for in HIV, um, really stigma um, is a legacy that we are still dealing with um, now, and um, it's really something that um, you know all of us uh, who have um, been through um, you know decades of the HIV response really um, want to see better response a more humane and compassionate one be put forward um, towards people who are diagnosed or uh, family members or others who are affected um, by the disease so 
you know, obviously HIV and SARS-CoV-2 are very different diseases, um, but there are certainly, I think, a number of parallels uh, in terms of uh, the negative outcomes that we're seeing around how people are being um, treated, um, and also then about uh, ability to seek care. Um, so I want to give a huge thank you to UNAIDS because uh, in March um, they put out uh, rights in the time of COVID-19 lessons from HIV for an effective community-led response. So going back to um, Lyndon's emphasis around community engagement, this is a critical element um, around addressing a stigma and really reframing how we talk about people who, um, you know, who are living with COVID-19. Um, so this, this guide really talks about a response that is based on solidarity, trust, and kindness. And that is essentially you know, what, what needs to happen. Um, and I think one of the critical elements here has to do with that, the piece around contact tracing. Um, you know, we do have that experience through HIV and through TB. Um, and one thing that I can say is, is that if contact tracing, as it is rolled out around the world, if it's not offered in a compassionate and a humane way that respects people's rights, um, and that's really informed by the community and monitored by the community, um, then there's going to be a lot of issues in terms of acceptability and the effectiveness of that approach. So um, I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Kim. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time, and I want to express my gratitude to our speakers for sharing their time and expertise with us today. It was great to hear your perspectives on what's happening both uh, globally and locally. And for those who attended, thank you for your engagement and your thoughtful questions. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get all of your questions back. We hope you'll continue to follow our series of webinars to hear more from experts within and outside of PATH. Whether PATH is new to you or you have followed our work for a long time, we appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Please stay in touch and thanks again. Thank you all. <laughs>